this morning. This is a 1.25 hour CPD presentation. Please ensure that you signed in for records, please. Thank you. Also, please put your mobile phones on silent. And for your safety, if you do hear a fire alarm, it is for real. So a member of the venue staff will escort you out of the rooms and building. The clothes room and ladies' toilets are to the left in the corridor, and the men's are to the right. Water and other refreshments can be brought forward from the breakout area, so if you do need anything else, please speak to Rabina, who's just outside. And if you booked the buffet lunch this afternoon, that will be ready after the presentation, but we do ask you that you complete the feedback form before leaving the, the room, please, they will be on the tables. And now just a very quick introduction to the speakers and the topic today. This morning's presentation is going to be an introduction in innovation in the insurance and legal sector. We have two speakers from Wakeman's. So Dr. Catriona Wolfenden and Richard Burrows. Catriona is Wakeman's Innovation Manager and she's responsible for the development, delivery and management of the firm's innovation and technology projects, as well as their broader innovation program. Richard is an associate at Wakeman's and he handles a mixed caseload of fast track and multi-track claims, specialising in conspiratory claims. Uh, so they'll provide an overview of what is possible now in the world of legal and insurance debt following a discussion on what might be possible in five years' time and various barriers and drivers to adoption of such technology. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Catriona. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to click that up. So this first half an hour really is to do a bit of an introduction to some of the kind of terminology um, that's around in the innovation space to hopefully kind of dispel some of the myths and to show you um, what, what kind of things are possible um, now. A couple of definitions really of AI, depending on whether you view it as a kind of a hard or a soft thing. Basically, the ultimate aim is to get computers to be able to replicate human functions. It's just a question of degree um, as to how far um, you think they're going to go. So, you know, visions of kind of robot takeover, obviously the very extreme end. And then the softer view of AI is using um, various techniques and systems to do some of maybe the more mundane tasks that um, we all kind of do within our life. So machine learning is basically getting the computer to begin to understand and to mimic um, with minimal programming what people um, are doing. A lot of this, to be fair, is just clever um, stats. If you monetize it, you tend to call it AI, but behind most of this um, is you know, statistics and data science. So we're gonna try not to be kind of too heavy on any of that as well. So Suskind, obviously um, a great proponent of um, AI in both the legal and kind of insurance space. Um, he thinks really people are on kind of a journey, much like X Factor, and there's four stages to that really. The first one is real skepticism um, of everybody kind of saying, you know, it's an absolute nonsense, it's not going to um, happen in my kind of sphere or profession. Second stage, moving on to, well, it's an interesting point, but kind of it's got nothing to do with anything I do. Third one, okay, I'm agreeing with it, it's quite true, but it's still not going to affect my world. And then the fourth one, the kind of evangelical, when I've come around to it, I've always said it, and, and that's the way it's going to go. And I think it's in both the insurance and the kind of legal space, um, we've certainly seen that move over the last kind of five years. So um, lots of new roles have existed. So I mean, I'm a partner at Waitman's, an innovation manager role didn't exist 18 months ago, there was no innovation team, that kind of thing. So it's certainly things that um, firms are coming around to. This is probably the best AI joke you see about custard creams and neural, ne neural networks. And this is just really to show that everybody wants to say everything's AI, um, and it's probably not. Um, it is just kind of clever statistics um, and data science, and there are an awful lot of myths. That said, there are some incredibly useful techniques and pieces of kind of data science, linguistic interpretations and stuff that can be wrapped up and parceled up um, to use in both the insurance and the legal world, and I'll, I'll talk you through some of them as well. But I think my main message really is, you know, read with a bit of scepticism when you see the headlines and stuff. There's an awful lot of hype. It's like the old thing, if it looks too good to be true, then it probably is. Um, you know, you dig around at what some uh, people are doing, and, it, it, you know, it's clever workflow, and there's a time and a place for workflow, but it's not kind of machine learning, that kind of thing. So kind of go with caution. I mean, that said, in the, in the general world, AI is never far from the headlines. And I've just put some kind of recent examples up there. Obviously, on your iPhone, you've got Siri. You can ask that everything. Um, great breakthroughs in the last couple of months in terms of using um, machine learning techniques to help diagnose cancer. So found algorithms are much more accurate at actually interpreting 
um, scans than a, than a human are, kind of really reducing um, the missed opportunities with that. And again, you know, autonomous vehicles never far from the headlines, um, and the, you know, the machine with one hand that can do the Rubik's cube. So, robotics, machine learning, all that kind of thing, um, very much, um, you know, in the headlines, kind of ar around the world as much as in insurance and legal tech. No worries. So, I mean, why are we looking at AI then in both law and insurance? I mean, AI is really good for problem solving, and that's what a lot of us are trying to do, either on a kind of a large scale or a smaller scale in our day-to-day -day jobs. And we can view a lot of kind of legal and insurance problems through that problem solving lens. So I've just broken some of the potential steps that AI there can help you with. So things about who should win a case, what are the consequences of a policy, can I get a machine to read it quickly, can it give me the information I need rather than having to plough through hundreds of documents? Can it tell me if the policy is valid? Can it start to interpret text? What does the evidence tell us? What if we've got photographs of car damage? Can we use anything to help with that? Um, you know, what should reserves be? What should financial settlements be? Can we use pools of past data to be able to help um, inform kind of current um, work as well? In terms of AI specifically in law, there's a massive kind of area of this. Um, it's gone actually at Liverpool University, it's been their kind of area for the last 30, 40 years, um, and they've been really leading the, the forefront in that, about using um, uh, machines to be able to argue in the way that a lawyer um, would do to start to put that um, into practice. So you can see there, there's, there are tools and techniques that are available that you can start to see how it would kind of impact upon um, the work that we all do or aspects of the work we do. Um, and really going back to basics with any of this, it's work out the problem you're trying to solve. So don't throw tech at something that actually is just, or is a problem that, you know, is, is a workflow problem or um, you're doing something in the wrong way, you just shouldn't be doing it. it AI isn't going to make everything better, it's just going to create faster chaos. So if you've got a rubbish system in the first place, it's just going to be a quicker rubbish system. Um, and that's one of the messages kind of internally we're really trying to get across is, you know, proper going back to basics and work out exactly what either your problem is, your customer's problems, um, and start to, to problem solve that way. So in terms of AI then, um, it's a pretty broad church in kind of some of the techniques and stuff um, that it includes. So you'll see there, we start at the top with machine learning, uh, again, broken down into deep learning and predictive analytics. We move through to kind of natural language processing, so various linguistic um, type skills, down onto speech and expert systems, a bit of robotics, and then some kind of vision recognition as well. And all of that's pretty much classed um, as AI. I thought perhaps one of the most useful things to do would be maybe to give you an explanation of some of those techniques and tools and then try and give you a practical example how it's relevant to law um, or insurance to give that a bit of context as well. You'll see I like pictures, it's all through the medium of pictures. Um, so machine learning, if we start off at, with that bit, I think that's really what a lot of people think of when they think of kind of innovation and, and AI, they think that's what things are going to be able to do. It's all about a system being able to learn automatically from um, pools of data and be able to uh, get better over time as well without necessarily having to be explicitly um, programmed. So it's that whole kind of loop of, I suppose, how you teach somebody, um, giving information, checking it, marking it, letting it go again, that kind of iterative process so that over you know days, weeks, months, as the data pool gets bigger and as the machine gets more accurate, you have more confidence in its results, that kind of thing. So the process begins really with making sure um, you've got a good data set, and that's why we talk about kind of going back to basics and all the statistics and stuff. If you have got a bad data set in the beginning, all you're gonna get out is a rubbish answer at the other end. So um, a lot of the work um, is often tidying up data sets. So particularly around MI fields and stuff, you know, are you all using the same terminology? Are you capturing figures on 100%? Are you including VAT, are you not including VAT? Um, are, you, are you defining dates in the same way? Um, because otherwise that's all going to impact upon the, the ultimate answer um, you get out. So there's a couple of types of machine learning models. So there's a supervised model, which basically you teach the computer. So you tell it right and wrong. The, the famous example is kind of pictures of cats and dogs. So you show it lots of pictures of cats, show it pictures of dogs, and then chuck a random one in and it, it tells you whether it's a cat or a dog. And that's very much a kind of labelled data set, so there have been people in the background there. 
physically labeling, telling the computer what it is. And I suppose that's one of the other things really to draw out from this. Although this is really clever computer wizardry, the actual human resource costs are really quite high. So you've got a whole team of people setting up labeling these things, making sure they're consistent as a group as well, um, starting to feed um, the algorithms as well. So that's your kind of supervised machine learning. So show it examples, labeled examples, um, give it unknowns, let it guess what it is, let it give the answer, correct it if it's wrong, and then keep feeding it back in. So the alternative then is the unsupervised learning. I suppose what's perhaps a little bit scarier is almost just chuck a pile of data to the system and say, right, go away, tell me all kinds of weird and wacky things. Um, and I suppose there's a couple of problems with that. The EU has recently published a charter on kind of responsible and social use of AI, ethical use of AI. Um, and a lot of work in the insurance and the legal space is all about explainability of decisions. Um, and being able to, so under GDPR, you can opt out of truly machine learning um, responses and stuff like that. So it's all about being able to explain why you've got to where you've, you've got with an answer, rather than just, well, we gave it a of data, we've no idea what it's done in the background, but here's a figure. Um, so it's all that kind of explainable um, AI that, that's really important. I mean, what machine learning does is, I suppose, what we couldn't traditionally have done is it can analyze massive amounts of data. Um, with really great levels of consistency as well um, in a much more kind of rapid time. So, you know, you can have the system whirling overnight. It's not going to get tired. It's not going to, you know, get, um, get distracted or that kind of thing. So the picture there on the left, for those of you worrying, is a random forest. Random forest is a specific type um, of machine learning model. Um, it's one of them we use quite often um, to be able to kind of categorize and bucket data into kind of smaller and smaller groups. Um, the picture on the, um, the right is a neural network, so more kind of a deep learning um, type figure, um, which we'll have a quick look at in a minute. So in terms of kind of practical examples then, so obviously good with big pools of data, so quite a few examples in the underwriting space where you can start to use um, data to be able to help predict and inform decision making. So things around being able to analyze risk, predict outcomes of um, you know, a case or a reserve figure and generate a quote. So being able to kind of, as if a, um, a handler's got all that information in their head, has been able to kind of do all the clever maths and then present the picture and, and the answer back. So really good on that kind of speeding up of massive data pool sets. Um, and again, getting better and better um, over time. Some of the specific kind of products um, are available on the bottom. So you've got tools like Sybil um, helping with claims prediction outcome. You've got Premonition in America, which ranks um, lawyers and is able to give you a kind of prediction as to whether they're the one for your type of case and what their kind of success and failure um, rate is like. I mean, obviously that kind of thing raises some quite big kind of ethical and social um, implications as to how far we want to go with, you know, ranking individuals um, on systems, um, obviously France, doesn't allow it, um, but you could see how you could get to a stage with quite easily accessible data that you could start to rank like judges or locations, court centres, all that kind of thing. Um, so it, it's just kind of how far um, we think that's appropriate to take, really. So natural language processing then um, is another really good technique um, that helps, in, I suppose, in a lot of different use cases, really. Um, it's a branch of AI that deals with the interaction of computers um, and humans using language. So it tries to replicate um, uh, human, human language. Um, easier said than done, to be fair, um, having had a play with it. So the object of um, natural language processing is to be able to read, decipher, and understand language in the same way that a human would interpret it. Um, it's really difficult because um, as you'll all know, everybody speaks, uses so many different words and stuff. There's so many um, kind of tone and regional and cultural uses of words and stuff. Um, you know, how does, how does a computer read sarcasm? Does it read the words on the page? That kind of thing. So um, really quite a difficult area to kind of get to the bottom of. Um, but that said, again, a lot of useful cases um, in both law and, um, and AI uh, and insurance, sorry. But again, really difficult because of that just variety. So you'll see in a minute, a lot of the use cases are quite narrow on specific types of data or um, pools of information as well. So there are um, 
some easy techniques to do, so you can use natural language processing to be able to spot kind of um, plurals of things. So an easy one, anything with an S, is, tends to be a plural on a word. So that would be quite an easy one to get a system to do. But actually to understand language, syntax and grammar, um, quite difficult. So I mean, in the 50s, there was a, a good example. So the phrase they tried to translate, this was to English to Russian and back again. Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Got translated to English and Russian and back to become the vodka is good, but the meat is rotten. <laughs> so you can see there, you know, possibly a lot lost in interpretation, although kind of the gist is there. And that, that's the really difficult bit um, with that kind of thing is it is just really, really hard, um, hard to do in terms of um, language. And, you know, the machine can just totally misunderstand um, and fail. And again, a lot of training in the background, so giving good examples of language um, and giving bad examples. And again, the massive kind of human factor so behind that is you have to have a team of consistent people marking up documents in a consistent way. Um, and as we all know, kind of groups of lawyers and insurers kind of in a room can't necessarily agree on a, on a draft or something. So it does make that much more complicated as well. The main kind of techniques behind this then are kind of um, sentiment analysis, um, semantics and syntax. So all about looking to parsing is quite a popular thing. So everybody talks about parsing the minute you talk about um, natural language processing. So that's basically doing a really um, strict grammatical interpretation of a sentence and phrase, um, and that can help um, to start breaking it down. There's quite a lot of work being done on kind of named entity recognition, so being able to pull out individual names, titles, jobs, um, addresses, physical locations, that kind of thing. Um, a little bit easier for systems because most of those things share common types of language um, so a lot of these systems will hang on so like a missus or a doctor knowing that the next bit's then going to be a name so um, a lot of them kind of work um, like that in terms then of kind of specific examples um, there's quite a few in this space um, and I suppose we all use optical character recognition so they all basically cloud platforms so you would have a selection of documents you'd upload it and they would apply um, OCR so optical character recognition to that text so you can upload PDFs word files whatever um, photocopied stuff and then it starts to process the difference between a lot of those systems is kind of the human element involved and how much you're letting the machine do and how much you're doing yourself so um, I think we've probably tried most of them um, and it's all about whether your class of documents is tight enough so a lot of these are really good on um, contracts leases that kind of document where if you think about it the language is really tight so um, on a rent review clause or a, 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 a lease with car parking there's only so many ways of describing that lawyers tend to stick to pretty formulaic text if you widen it out into kind of the personal injury sphere you know, when you look to do claims notification forms, medical reports on them, suddenly you've opened up a much, much bigger pool of language so people describing those kind of things in their own words. And it's not that it's impossible to train, it's just a much bigger um, job um, <coughs> in the off. So a lot of these kind of work out the box on pretty standard documents. Um, we've done quite a lot with, um, with some of those tools in particular. So you can literally upload a document, you can have it reviewed, and you can have a summary of that or whatever bits you've chosen kind of literally spat out in real time. The work again with that is marking up the set, so having your subject matter expert. Um, and I think this, we'll talk about this later, is maybe one of the, the reasons for non-adoption is a lot of these systems, it's only as good as the expert usually who's done it. And the experts, wherever they are, are usually the most um, expensive in terms of time. So telling somebody they're not going to be billing a client a couple of hundred pounds an hour because you want them to literally mark up on a computer system. Um, doesn't necessarily go down well, but it's a false economy to think that somebody kind of new to the area can just go through and mark up. Um, it's really about kind of getting that expertise in the system so that then as it's rolled out, um, it, it's much, much better um, going through as well. So, um, I mean, I'll talk about kind of Kira um, in particular. Again, a lot of these have dashboards. So, I mean, um, Luminance has a really lovely kind of cluster um, diagram. You can kind of dive through into your documents. You can see groups um, and how they interrelate to, to one another. Um, Kira's dashboards, I suppose, are a bit more functional in terms of, well, what are the terms within my documents? How can I pull them out? Um, but they all offer um, as systems the ability to kind of export and be able to manipulate the data as well. 
So quite often we're these really good on big portfolio reviews of kind of um, contracts and, um, and the like. So anything where you've got you know, multiple documents of the same type and you want to pull out certain information, you can do it within that and then you can stop the whole kind of having to go away and fill the spreadsheet in as well. Those, these systems start to do the whole thing for you um, as well, which has been quite, quite successful. So we've moved kind of through the more um, machine learning kind of techniques. So um, machine learning, natural language processing. We're now going to have a good at a look at kind of good old fashioned expert systems. Um, this is what Richard Suskin basically started off his kind of whole AI and innovation work on. Uh, did a PhD on it and started. Um, you see up there with the Latent Damages Act. And it's been kind of a, a hobby horse of his for a while. And again, so as, as I've spoken about before, it is all about encoding in a way that um, a computer can then argue um, with facts and information. Um, and it's been able to accurately get that information um, out of a lawyer or whoever and what, in a way that a computer can then um, reason with it as well. So types of uses kind of broadly, so things about classification, diagnosis, control, all those kind of yes, no, don't know questions. So anything where you would be looking to follow a, a relatively logical workflow where there's a bit of sense to it. Um, and I think quite often in insurance and the legal space, we think about that really, really broadly. And we think the area is really complicated. We can't possibly kind of chunk it up and, and do anything. But what we found is actually breaking down an area into like specific discrete little decision bits has been really helpful. Um, so again, going back to the problem you're trying to solve with these kind of expert systems, I suppose it's all about consistency of decision making. So it's about having uh, maybe junior fee earners and colleagues, people new to a business with no experience, it's giving them the knowledge of the person you know, who's been handling that type of matter for 20 years, picks it up, goes, yep, it's one to settle and that's the figure. And it's building that kind of knowledge in so that from day one, they get that kind of support as they're going. And again, with all these things, I don't think anybody would ever want to be in the position where it's kind of computer says yes, computer says no. And there has to be some kind of human involvement as well. Um, but I think it's about offering consistency and support with these kind of tools and actually freeing up, um, you know, experts' time to do actually the jobs that they're trained for. So, you know, lawyers don't want to sit there filling in MI fields and you know, that kind of thing. There's much more valuable things they can be doing, interacting with the clients and adding real value. So anything that can help speed these processes up can help with indemnity spend, that kind of thing, um, you know, is, is to be encouraged. And again, um, another pile of, of products that are out there at kind of various stages uh, of iteration. And again, with a lot of these products, I've just kind of picked some of the most popular um, ones. Um, Legal Geek produced the, um, the tube map with all of these products on, and it kind of goes on and on forever, kind of trying to categorize them. Um, you know, and literally every day I have a phone call off a new vendor going, we've got something, it's different to X, Y, and Z because, um, and there is just such a, a, a massive demand at the moment in the kind of startup community. And again, I think a, a lot of them are missing a few tricks because they haven't differentiated themselves enough from the competition. They haven't really worked out what the problem is they're trying to solve. They just kind of jumped on it. Um, so again, I mean, just literally off the top of my head, that's four systems that will do this kind of capturing knowledge um, and letting you run it as a system. Um, do not pay was the student who obviously didn't want to pay parking fines and has kind of branched out, so that was his own um, one that he's done. Brighter and Neota and Busy Rule. Uh, Busy Rule is one of the blokes behind kind of Contract Express at Thomson Reuters. Brighter and Neota Logic both pride themselves as being no code or low code solutions. Because, I mean, that's the other thing in insurance companies and legal firms you're not necessarily going to have a massive IT department that actually wants to start playing with this because there's enough trying to keep everything else or the business uh, as usual stuff going. So what they've, they've tried to do um, with a lot of these products is make them kind of as easy to use as possible um, for kind of non-computer um, uh, background people as well. So Brighter, Neota, no code or low code solutions that you can literally kind of draw out your, almost your decision tree and almost live program it as you go through as well. So I mean the vision aspect of AI um, is quite interesting and obviously has developed rapidly obviously since kind of technology has so now we've all got cameras on our phones that are much much higher quality and stuff and have allowed to do kind of much more um, interesting things. The way I, uh, AI behind this works is almost a bit like a jigsaw and kind of human vision it's all about um, pixelating 
tiny bits of things into little bits and then starting to connect them almost like a jigsaw to be able to start um, sifting them again um, in the background. And some quite interesting use cases then um, in the kind of the insurance uh, and AI and, and legal world really. Tractable um, is a tool that will use photographs of um, damage to vehicles, that kind of thing and we'll compare them against other ones that it's got within the system to look if the damage is consistent um, with the quotes that are then being provided for the repair. So to be able to kind of lay, overlay things um, on top of each other. Um, CAPE again, another interesting one. So in the kind of the property risk space, um, using technology, um, using kind of Google Earth, to be able to see you know, whether somebody's got a trampoline in the garden, whether there's a swimming pool, whether the trees look too close to the drive and it's gonna kind of cause an issue. Um, so really kind of being able to drill in and then to start to be able to tailor individual um, quotes for, for specific type risks with a lot more kind of data um, there in the background. Um, it wouldn't really be talk on innovation and AI if we didn't at least mention blockchain. Um, never know what I think about blockchain if I'm entirely honest. I can't decide if it's just something looking for um, a problem to fix. Um, I think the best example I've kind of heard it described, because it can be hellishly complicated, is almost an indelible track change on a Word document. <coughs> so it's like everybody's got the same version of the document, and everybody's just track changing and can see everybody's. Nobody can remove anything, so it all just kind of sits there um, forever and a day. Um, and I in that sense, um, it is permanent. And I suppose the, the reason I sp people like it is because of that permanency. Um, they think it's it's not unhackable because nothing is, but it would be harder to kind of hack every version of it. So, um, I mean, the use cases in insurance um, and, and law are all around kind of smart contracts um, and that kind of thing. But again, kind of not necessarily falling within the rest of the machine learning um, and AI techniques um, as well. So any questions then on that kind of rattle through with some of the most kind of prevalent techniques? Go for it. Yes. So it's really it's a it's a an indelible ledger. So it's a way of passing information between interested parties and stuff. So another good example is you know like the Russian dolls. So you start off with the tiny little Russian doll, and I paint it in magic paint. I give it to Richard, who also has magic paint, and he puts my tiny one in the next one. So it stays locked in that, and as the chain kind of grows. Everybody keeps putting their Russian doll on top of each other. We all use the same paints. So we've all got the same unlock to it, but nobody can alter it without everybody else kind of yeah. seeing it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, smart contracts, that kind of thing is, is the most, I suppose, topical use case of it at the moment. Um, but it's all about making sure everybody's on the same platform and the infrastructure and stuff um, is there. So, yeah, who knows? It's always topical, isn't it? But who, who knows kind of where that will eventually eventually go. So I'm going to hand over to Richard now for a, uh, a talk about kind of what's possible using some of those techniques maybe in the next five years. Yep. Um, so yeah, if you um, if you like me, um, when it turned 2020 at the start of the year, that already sounded mm -hmm. like a very uh, futuristic year and that we should have mm -hmm. flying cars and things, but obviously we don't. But we do have a lot of things that um, if you look back only 10 years ago, we didn't have. Um, and which are uh, available to us now and, and really you sort of can't remember what you did b before you had them. Um, so if we look at um, connected devices um, that, we, that we've got, um, there's going to be so, there's so much data that is available and it's being collected all the time that, you, that, you, that you're aware, uh, aware of. So for example, if you look at your mobile phone, when you take a photograph, it can pinpoint your GPS location where you are. Um, if you've got um, a smart watch or like a Fitbit type watch that can count your steps and, and your physical activity. So there's data being generated all the time, um, not necessarily by you inputting it, but just by it being collected by your, your other activities. Um, if you look at things in an industrial environment, um, technologies had sensors in um, machines for, for a number of years. Um, so a response is triggered by a computer detecting that something is present uh, and the sensor responds to that. So, so we've had a, a basic level of AI for, for, for quite a long time. Um, 
cars, fitness trackers, smartphones, um, which can count your steps and, and y y your location, uh, and smart watches. Um, there's new devices coming out all the time. If you think of things like Google Glass, which are those um, glasses which have the cameras built in, into them, um, and home equipment, Alexa, and, and, and things like that. Um, th they're coming in all the time, they're <coughs> collecting more and more data. Um, and you know things like your watch can detect your heart rate and, and, and collect information like that, which um, a few years ago you just have a, a manual watch, which the battery would run out. <laughs> um, so yeah, so there's much more uh, data being generated and available, and that's going to help insurers um, understand their clients and offer more personalised products and um, pricing and, and provide a real-time delivery service. Um, so your fitness tracker could connect to um, an actuarial database, uh, which could calculate personal risk scores. Um, which are based on your daily activities and your exercise levels uh, and the probability and severity of potential events which could happen to you. Um, physical robotics in the next few years, um, you've, you've probably already seen about um, autonomous drones, for example, like Amazon using drones to deliver parcels in America, um, and which will no, no doubt come over here at some point. Um, Self-driving cars. Um, by 2030, it's estimated that 25% of cars on the on the roads will be uh, will be self-driven. Um, autonomous farming equipment, um, which can can sort of carry out l you know, manual labour tasks um, in, in bulk. Um, enhanced surgical um, enhanced surgical robots will also be available, um, and, and that's all within the next decade. Also, um, the developments in 3D printing, um, wh whether there will be in the manufacturing industry, it's it's easy to, to to print certain things now, um, and, and it will be possible to eventually um, build, what well, use three D printers to um, to create buildings. So there'll be shifts in risk pools, uh, and as there's more and more data, it will be shared across more and more industries. Um, so with, between the different industries, they'll have to create standard definitions and classifications of of, of what a specific piece of data means and what class it is. Um, so the data and the devices um, could be sent straight to insurers. We've got cognitive technologies, which will also be, be available. So look at deep learning techniques, which are based on human brains learning patterns, rather than just collecting manual pieces of data. And there'll be increased commercialization. So it, products, as Kat was saying, where there's new products coming out all the time, they'll be constantly wanting to learn and adapt and, 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 and respond to um, underlying risks and behaviors in, in real time so that they are sort of the top of their, their game and they are the product to, to go to. Specifically in relation to underwriting, by 2030, it's anticipated that manual underwriting will have severely decreased, and, it'll, uh, and, it, and it will then be um, automated. Uh, internal data as well as external data will be used, uh, and aggregated data will be used as a base and can then be um, personalized to an individual customer's needs uh, and their risk profile. Um, and again, competition again between products won't just be on price, but just how reactive the technology is and how it responds to the change in data that's available to it. From a claims perspective, drones um, are likely to be used to identify loss. Uh, and one of the examples that I'll come back to you later, I think it's Hurricane Harvey in America, where they use drones to assess property damage in areas where it wasn't possible to access. And they were actually able to value three houses per day rather than per week. Um, so the, so the, the, the advances there are obviously very useful. And, and also in, in instances where there's been catastrophes, the um, drones are obviously very useful because they can get into places where um, humans might not necessarily be able to. Um, in relation to cars, this one I found quite interesting was that, um, if, the, for example, if you were in a self-driven car which was involved in an accident, um, the repair services will be triggered automatically and you might even get to the stage where the car actually drives itself to the garage to get repaired. And also the fact that the car's been involved in the accident will then trigger your um, service car to, 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 to come out and replace it. So that's uh, <laughs> quite interesting to see how that one uh, works out. Um, but also on a more basic level, um, again, using mobile phones, um, you know, individuals involved in accidents may be required to um, stream, uh, stream live video of the accident scene to, to ensure so they can obviously look at the scene as it is um, at, at the time, rather than relying on sort of anecdotal descriptions of, of what's happened. Um, in relation to homes, um, devices that can monitor water levels and temperatures and other key factors can help alert tenants and insurers of risks of potential hazards that are going to, for example, if your, if your house is on fire and the temperature was rising quite quickly, you could have an app that would tell you that <laughs> if you weren't there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, automated customer service apps. 
um, which use voice and text. So there's already the little pop-up windows that you can get for some, for some service providers. But they can also be taught to learn scripts which interact with different teams. For example, claims teams, fraud teams, medical services teams, policy coverage and repair systems. Uh, and the turnaround times then for claims can be significantly reduced. Um, there'll still be a human role, but that will tend to be more for the, uh, the complex and unusual claims and, and contested claims, which will involve some level of human interaction and, and negotiation. And also, um, the, the, it's obviously healthy to have some uh, yeah, random manual reviews of claims just to check that the uh, computers are behaving themselves, essentially. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so customer interaction with insurance claims. Um, Organisations will focus on avoiding potential loss uh, and individuals will be able to receive real-time alerts which may be linked to automatic interventions for inspection, maintenance uh, and repair so it will keep customers updated as the process uh, goes through. Um, for large-scale catastrophe claims, um, insurers will be able to monitor homes and vehicles in real-time using inter integrated um, mobile phone data, telematics uh, and that's, well, that is assuming that um, networks don't go down, which I'm sure sometimes when Facebook goes down and things, it causes all host of problems. <laughs> so you are sort of relying on the technology there, and that's obviously one of the, the downfalls there. But when, um, in situations where, say, power, power, power supplies have gone down, it, insurers will be able to pre-file claims uh, by using data aggregators, uh, which will consolidate data from satellites, network drones, weather services, and policyholder data in, in real time. So the dynamics of it, the dynamics of insurance um, are going to change uh, in, in the future. So historically, the parties to an insurance contract, so the insurer and the insured, um, have always had a different set of information, uh, and that's led to, to strategy um, being developed between the parties and using different pieces of information to, to each party's advantage. Um, and the, the in, in, in general, the insurers will try to extract the maximum amount of data through questionnaires, observations and statistics um, so that they can infer how an insured will behave. Uh, the insured, on the other hand, might try to um, strategically position themselves to underestimate a risk to, to maximise the value of their claim uh, and to manipulate the price of the insurance policy to their advantage. Um, but with AI, um, it's going to be possible to, to sort of completely alter the asymmetry by bringing in comprehensive and dynamic obser observability to the insurance transaction. Um, so whereas the information was previously incomplete, static and delayed, um, the, the, the new era of big data enables access to information that's comprehensive, accessible from multiple sources but available to both parties. So the, um, and also the cost of obtaining information will be reduced to, to minimal expense if you're using things like drones. It's obviously that the, the, the cost of the drone is going to be cheaper than sending out people to, um, to sites. Um, enhanced, inf ooh, enhanced efficiencies. Um, so AI is going to enable the insurance industry to improve the customer experience uh, and to enhance efficiencies in underwriting, claims processing, risk analysis and product development. So tasks that once took months to complete uh, can, can take place in a matter of minutes. Um, so there'll be plenty of cost savings there. So for the example of you know, looking through medical records, for example, going through those a lot quicker than having someone manually go through them. But obviously the trade-off of that is the experience of someone looking at those with their, their, their knowledge. So um, insurance professionals are then going to be able to focus their time on, on value-added tasks because admin time will also be reduced by uh, technological advances. Um, then, through the creation of a more rigorous and systematic detection system of fraud, errors and risks, AI can probably solve a lot of challenges in the risk universe that we have, um, but it's not going to eliminate risks all, altogether. Uh, like all technological developments, um, new risks are going to be cr created. Um, for example, if the software were to be poorly programmed or if a bug was introduced, uh, the output could lead to, um, to um, an extremely suboptimal decision. Uh, and that's why it's important to still have the sort of human elements of, of testing the, uh, the claims and sort of sampling the, the risk. There's also the risk of cyber, cyber attacks, um, whether that's unintentional, for example, like program errors or bugs uh, or, or malicious cyber attacks, which are, which are intentional, uh, which you sometimes come across in the, in the media. Um, so, yeah, so cyber, cyber, the risk of cyber attacks will become increasingly more significant as AI technology becomes more widely adapted um, so life risks as well. Um, consumers are going to be more aware of their health and what insurance they need. So it, that, that could potentially be a good, um, good knock-on effect um, from, from AI monitoring their uh, activities. Um, for example, consumers um, may be able to access 
uh, genetic predictive tools, um, such as face mapping mobile applications, which use learning, uh, machine learning technologies uh, to predict potential future illnesses. So the use of such applications greatly increases the anti-selection risk for insurers, especially where insurers are prohibited from accessing genetic testing results for underwriting purposes. Uh, the increased data available from lifestyle type sensors provides the opportunity for, insur for insurers to better price their, um, their risks. Um, in relation to casualty risks, uh, there's multiple aspects of workers' compensation insurance and related medical uh, markets which could dramatically change in the future due to AI technological advancements um, across the underwriting and claims spectrums. Uh, in underwriting, AI could directly influence risk selection and pricing accuracy in two regards. So first, with respect to um, deployment of AI monitoring tools, dynamically capable of um, proactive controls in dangerous or accident-prone environments, for example, refineries, which are potentially hard to access. And then secondly, through loss and pricing data processing improvement carriers used to define sub-market strategies and client targeting. <coughs> Property risks, um, again, back to the autonomous machines like self-driving cars, um, autonomous equipment can be used for medical care, manufacturing, farming, mining, telematics and warfare. Uh, which may have profound implications for, for property insurance. Um, human error is still the main cause of the accidents in the first place. Um, so a wider use of autonomous machines might lead to a trans uh, transition from loss frequency to severity, and property losses may accumulate in new ways. So defining and assigning liability will be more challenging for insurers due to grey areas on who is liable when a technology fails and an accident occurs. So as manufacturing becomes more technologically and um, intelligently advanced, challenges will arise on assessing liabilities, um, covers and policy wording. Um, so for example, claims may be filed not just against manufacturers, but also against the companies providing the technology, for example, the, the company that created the drone, not just the specific um, drone and the, the people piloting it. So insurers will also need to assess their risks in the medium and long term, uh, especially in the context of transition periods when human uh, and autonomous machines coexist. Uh, autonomous machines will also provide many opportunities for insurers in terms of improved risk management, especially in the context of risk prevention and disaster mitigation. Uh, drone aerial intelligence, which is going back to the, um, the Hurricane Harvey situation, is going to enable people to um, assess um, information from the sky and obviously in difficult areas which are difficult to access uh, after man-made or natural disasters. Um, and in relation to the Hurricane Harvey um, example, two U.S. insurance companies uh, launched drones, and, and it was yeah three hours sorry three hours an hour three houses an hour were assessed rather than three houses a day. So there's obviously uh, significant savings, savings to have, and that's not in the too distant future. That's uh, in the next sort of five to ten years. Okay, so I was just going to um, conclude really by looking at some of the kind of the barriers and the drivers to the adoption of some of this. Uh, both kind of the insurance um, and the legal industry because it's clear that there's a lot of change kind of happening and on the horizon um, and there's lots of studies out at the moment about kind of where the world of work will look like in 2030. Um, I've got a five-year-old, there'll probably be jobs that we don't even know exist yet that, that he could be doing and obviously that has a knock-on effect on kind of the wider society um, and you know professions and, and what we're all going to be doing. So the greatest barrier and drivers to adoption, anybody like to hazard a guess what the biggest one is? Yeah, but people really. <laughs> so people are kind of the, 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 yeah, the, the, the biggest either supporter or detractor from using a lot of this technology. Um, and I think, I suppose it's fair to say there's quite a polarity of views as well. There aren't kind of many people in the middle. People are either really sceptical um, or at the really kind of evangelical end. And again, so hopefully the, the previous talks have shown that there's a lot of kind of manual work to making these systems work. So you need a lot of people to buy into them in the beginning. And then the rollout of these obviously impacts upon people's jobs. So, you know, there's a pretty um, big perception that, you know, if a machine comes, it's going to take my job what the hell am I going to do? You know, I've sat there and done this for the last 20 years. What does my world of work look like now? Um, and I think we should be quite optimistic about this. I think we should look to use the techniques and the tools and stuff to actually free up our time so that we are leaving the office at 5 o'clock. We do all get that work-life balance. We're actually using the machines to do the jobs that, frankly, are bits of jobs we don't want to do. So, you know, things like data collection and stuff, so everybody does it, everybody needs it and to provide to kind of their own clients and filter that down. 
but actually it's not a job that particularly anybody likes doing. So if we can do that and kind of start to automate bits like that, um, then, you know, so much the better, really. So, I mean, one of my roles um, is kind of a, almost a hearts and minds battle of literally touring the offices, showing the tech, going, come on, some jobs aren't going to go. Um, and it's been quite interesting. So some of the kind of, we thought it might be a bit generational, so we thought maybe some of the older partners would be quite sceptical about the tech and maybe some of the trainees coming through would be, um, you know, brought up on mobile phones and stuff, so really up for it. And it's not really divided like that. It's been quite weird. Um, almost the kind of the younger end has been more fearful of what that's going to mean for their world of work. If you think of some of these tools, so Kira for reading um, contracts, and we, you know, we use it on collateral warranties and stuff. If you're having a machine help read them and speed them up, how would you get that experience and training? So I think, you know, kind of as a, as a collective industry, we've got to look at how we upskill people and make sure they still have relevant training. So the fact that the machine's read it means on day two, they're not suddenly given much harder work that traditionally, you know, they might not have got for a few years and stuff. But, and that requires kind of cultural changes and changes in the way we, we train um, people as well. So I've got just two slides really to kind of talk through some of the main um, drivers and barriers really to the adoption. This is specifically it was law tech, but I think actually a lot of the stuff um, is relevant really regardless of industry. This was um, a study done last year by the um, Law Society. You'll see the things at the top are the biggest kind of either pressure or, or um, opponent for it. And up there right at the top is client pressure. And that's really one of the major reasons why um, people are adopting um, technology. It's that kind of squeeze on price um, and to get kind of create more for less and the, the added value and stuff. So to be able to um, process files quicker, be able to give decisions quicker, initial valuations, that kind of thing. Um, and to be able to so still keep that volume and that level of service and accuracy and consistency, but just to be able to kind of report and be much more um, accurate early on. So, I mean, especially in the kind of legal world, it, again, it's quite polarised. There's firms like ours where we've done fixed fees forever and a day, so it's not something new to us, where as some of the, the firms, all that kind of pricing um, in relation to kind of work done rather than the, the hours model, it's quite different. Um, and they're just starting to have to look to, for, for tech to drive some of those um, efficiencies as well. And we're starting to see as well, so technology innovation, it's a question that comes up um, on tenders and stuff. Um, clients in all kind of industries, insurance being no exception, are specifically saying, you know, show us of, of examples of some of this. Where have you actually used it? How has it added value? How does it make our life better? Um, rather than you've just kind of used something and bought something and it, it's sat there on a the shelf. So client pressure does still really remain one of the kind of key drivers um, for the adoption. Underneath that then really kind of equally you've got competitive pressures um, and the kind of hype and publicity. Competitive pressures is quite interesting in both the insurance and the legal world, really, because a lot of um, kind of traditional firms, the older ones, um, are um, operating a lot of legacy systems, um, not necessarily as, as tech savvy as a new incumbent into a, into a market, so whether that be an insurer um, or a legal firm. So they're the kind of ones to watch those kind of small, agile, born digital, using technology from the beginning. So what they don't have at the moment is that competitive advantage in terms of they don't have all the data that we all sit on. So, you know, if you've insured people for the last 20 years, you've got that pool of data. You know, we've done claims for forever and a day. That's, that pool of data sits there so we can start to, to do things with that. But equally, the, the newer ones, the digital ones, have that agility to be able to kind of process and get new things in um, and start to kind of compete in that market as well. Um, hype and publicity, um, there is an awful lot of digital lipstick and kind of publicity around um, AI and tech. You know, in all the kind of trade presses a day or a week doesn't go by without somebody announcing something that looks like techie and whizzy. Um, every time that happens, I get an email from all my partners going, but why haven't we got this? Um, you know, and there's a lot of that kind of, well, so-and-so's doing it, why haven't we? And I think, as, you know, a lot of, the, of, the, of my role as well is to cut through some of that hype and go, well, actually, when you read it, Although they've written it beautifully in the Gazette, when you actually work out what it does, it can't possibly do that, or it's shifted you know, the work to somebody else, or it's been outsourced to a different country. Um, some of the things that are patented, you look at the patent and you go, well, it's workflow, it's lovely, it's now badged as AI. Um, and you know, it's not to say that those tools don't have efficiencies and stuff and aren't useful, but um, there is just an awful lot of, of puff and, and um, that kind of thing in the market. 
and you'll see that as you start to kind of see these tools and techniques come into your own organisation. So um, we've had a lot of trials of things that we've actually kind of either stopped midway through or just not continued with because they come in, um, you know, can, can sell you the world and everything, can fix whatever problem, um, even if they've never tried it before, really willing to give it a go. You go, well, ours is a little bit unusual, are you sure? And they're like, yep, 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 we can do it in two weeks. And they come in, two weeks pass, you know they're not going to do it. Um, and again, they're just as keen to just try and get the publicity for the firms as well, for them to be able to kind of drive more more investment and stuff. So, yeah, really kind of watch the, the, the publicity angle um, with a lot of it. The next rung there really, um, increasing volume of work, legacy systems and regulatory drivers, again, are um, things that are helping get the adoption um, of law tech up. So, and a, you know, we as a law firm don't sit there thinking we're gonna grow our business by doubling our physical headcount of people. Um, the days of kind of everybody, you know, extra, we get another 10 files in, we get another kind of lawyer to service and that kind of thing are gone. It's not that kind of one-to-one -one ratio and kind of stuff anymore. Um, and using some of these tools and techniques um, allow you to do um, more with your day. So it's not necessarily expecting people to stay longer in the office, it's just to be much more um, streamlined and effective with the time. So removing those bits of the jobs um, that they don't like doing. Legacy systems, again, quite an interesting one. This appears on the drivers um, and the detractors. Again, lots of legacy systems, so either insurers who've bought other um, companies, law firms who've merged with other um, companies, they're um, all trying to run off different systems. So you may have separate pools of data. Are they all defined the same? How do you kind of start to merge them and stuff? So at that end, there's some kind of quick wins you can do on almost a robotic process automation bit to help with aspects of that. So some of the more mundane tasks. Um, something we've just brought in is email filing. So all the emails that come into Outlook automatically get filed into our case management system. So you think, well, I'm not sure that's a massive win for a law firm, but actually it's taking 30 seconds per email to save an email um, within the system. And actually, if you scale that up, a lot of these tiny little wins actually on, on scale um, are worth doing. And again, kind of regulatory drivers, so there's more pressure to like know your client or the money laundering kind of things. Um, a lot more data at the beginning of a case to kind of start checking and stuff. Um, and there's lots of systems that can then start to, to help with that as well. And then at the bottom, really, I suppose some of these factors that I suspect if they did the survey, you know, now or in the next couple of years would kind of creep up that list as well. So um, things about changing dynamics and demographics of a workforce and agility and stuff. So um, a, a move to much more agile working. So we as a firm have gone agile, we've dramatically reduced our kind of office space, um, people are working at home. And that starts you to force to have all these systems that are interconnected. People expect the tech to be a lot better. So um, a lot of insurers and, and legal firms actually upgrading their basic tech, which allows you to do then a lot more with, with some of the clever, wizzier stuff. And again, kind of acceptance of cloud technology. I mean, 10 years ago, insurers and, and legal firms wouldn't have gone anywhere near the cloud. Um, now there's a, a lot of the tools um, and kind of case management systems exist on that. Um, you know, and there's a lot of kind of safeguards in place around that, but a lot of these then AI tools then piggyback off the back of that. So they all use the kind of Amazon web service um, kind of structure and, and, and safety net um, with that as well. And again, then being able to access them wherever you are. So a lot of the um, like the document review tools, cloud-based, you can be sat anywhere doing it and doing the work. So um, helping with that kind of agility um, and that kind of changing demographic um, of the workforce as well. So in terms of barriers to adoption then, again, so you'll see that there's some overlap with that um, previously one. Again, things like legacy systems can be good or bad, so it can get to the stage actually that you've just got data in so many different pots, you've no idea how you've ever defined it. There's no way on earth that it's ever gonna merge. Um, and that obviously does then pose some difficulties for adopting um, some of this tech. You either decide to almost have like a day zero and start again, or you're using a much smaller um, pool of data as well. And again, so kind of technical barriers. So um, law firms and insurance firms are no different. You expect kind of a minimum viable product with a lot of these things. A lot of these things are quite literally um, two people in a bedroom as a startup kind of thing. And you bring them into an organization and they are almost overawed by the amount of the hoops that they have to, to jump through and stuff. Um, so we've got quite a, a lengthy um, like procurement process and you ask, you know, two people in a bedroom, what's your modern slavery policy? And they're like, well, there's two of us, we didn't think we needed one. 
um, but it's all that kind of regulatory bit that needs to be there in the background that a lot of these startups just don't have. And again, um, totally unrealistic um, as to what they think um, people will work with. So it's been, you know, their life's work since they've come out of uni, they think it's really shiny and, and amazing. They come in and you go, well, that's really great, but I've got a pile of lawyers that need it to put the information back in my case management system. Can you do that? And the kind of blank face that it would need to interact with anything. So um, kind of misconceptions on both sides as to what the tech will do and then what the tech needs to, to do again. Um, and that's something we're very keen to make. I mean, a lot of these systems, there's no point having it if actually you're increasing a lawyer or um, an insurer's time by having to double key entry um, stuff into various systems. That's just a, a complete waste of time. So again, that, that process barriers bit, that relates again to the, just the sheer number of hoops that we make people jump through um, in terms of procurement. We want everybody's policies for, for cyber and everything. And, and it's not just about getting the tech in and buying it. So you'll see like loads of headlines that so-and-so is using this tool, so-and-so is using that. And then I bet if you went back to them two years after, they go, well, what actually, are you, are you still using it? What's your adoption rate like? A lot of them will just kind of be sat on the shelf. Um, the buying it bit is almost the easiest bit. It's actually the getting it um, used. And again, that's not something that happens by osmosis. It requires a lot of planning. It requires a kind of a lot of banging heads. And um, you know, I'm sure we all know people in our, our organizations who struggle with Word and Excel. So asking them to use some piece of machine learning things or to go and speak to clients about it is just something that's not in their skill set. Um, and again, you get people at different ends of that. You'll get people who are quite open and go, do you know what, I know nothing about this, but I can see it's coming and it's going to be useful, so go for it. Um, you know, come with me and, and show it. And then you'll get the people who just think, well, it's just not relevant, I'm not going to engage kind of thing. Um, so there's those kind of organisational and cultural um, hurdles to get over as well. Um, things about kind of pricing and partnership models and stuff don't necessarily help in the legal um, sphere for getting it in. Um, as I've said, we're quite used to fixed fees, but there'll be some firms who've charged an hourly rate for everything. If you say, well, I can get a machine to read contracts in an hour that previously you billed the client 10 hours for, you can see straight away they're thinking, well, I've lost my nine hours worth of money, so how am I going to make that up? And I think we'll see a move really to almost like value-based pricing, because it's not that the machine hasn't done the job and you as a client have still got it, and I think it'll be about kind of sharing those benefits. So... Um, and you know, both sides recognising the upfront time that actually is needed to buy the software and to train it and keep it up to date um, as well. Partnership model, particular thing obviously for kind of law firms, but I suppose in, in the insurance world, it's just, I suppose, management structures, um, a lot of different stakeholders at various levels, um, everybody thinking their department or idea is the most important and the one to back. Um, and there kind of be no real way of prioritising them um, and getting stuff through without kind of causing um, all kinds of issues. Um, security concerns um, and their life cycle uh, are kind of nearer the bottom. So a lot of them have been um, kind of mitigated now. Um, a lot of the tech, the tech uses um, the Amazon Web Service, which a lot of the um, services that we already use, kind of case management systems and stuff, our finance systems already built on. So that does allay a lot of the fears there. The, um, the life cycle thing is quite interesting. So, I mean, we've had um, some demos we had almost a year ago that are still kind of chunnering through proof of concept and um, supplier procurement type phases. Um, and, you know, by the time we get it, the problem could have gone. So it's to try and kind of keep processes that are, um, are robust enough for scrutiny and stuff, but actually allow innovation um, to, to try a, and take place as well. So. Um, you'll see a lot of kind of innovation departments have tried to go for a much more kind of agile sprint mentality where you kind of fail fast, you get stuff in, you have a concerted effort on it and decide to kind of go or, or ditch it um, quite quickly as well. Um, and then the last ones really, so around um, the lack of customer um, and client centricity and, and the kind of cost modelling and stuff. I think regardless of your client segment and, and, and kind of background, um, clients again don't always know what they want so some of it is not knowing what's available kind of the art of the possible some of it is um, you know we've got a system that works why kind of try and, and meddle with it um, but I think you know we've had groups of insurers in a room and kind of all had varying um, degrees of interest in kind of like the vision tools or the machine learning and how far they want to go whether they're kind of up for the, the true um, 
untrained um, machine learning or that kind of thing. So even where you think there might be a bit of consensus and you've all kind of broadly got the same problem, um, not necessarily as, um, as, as uniformed and as harmonized um, as you might think. So that was um, really us done, kind of a whistle stop tour of all things innovation. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything? Yeah, you will do. There'll be copies of the slides, and um, I mean, I know the rules of this prohibit us like to talk in specific examples and stuff. But um, there are things we can we can chat about later if people want to like know a bit more about physically what these things do and stuff. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much for coming and of course thank you very much for the speakers as well. Before we close, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the Erler Academy mm -hmm. and the Erler YPG. Of course feel free to ask any questions as I'm talking through this. So the Erler Academy provides a number of training programs from breakfast briefings to half day courses. I think there's actually one this afternoon about on-gen rates and link and learn events as well. All sessions are specific to the legacy sector. The courses are fully accredited by the CII, the CPD. Mm -hmm. Then the Earl of YPG is also a great platform for networking, sharing, learning and development. We currently have 375 members and the numbers continue to grow, which is great. The YPG offers a number of different benefits, such as the mentoring scheme, which is a great opportunity for young professionals to connect with more senior professionals in the market and seek advice on pretty much anything from technical topics to conflict resolution and career progression. In addition to what's already on this slide, you can get the Earl of um, YPG logbook as well, which can be downloaded from the YPG section on the Earl of website. You still have two months to complete as many sections as you can in order to be in with the chance to win a £200 or £75 Amazon voucher, as well as a free one-day pass to con Congress this May. And from my perspective, I've been part of the YPG for almost five years now, and I've benefited greatly from going to training courses to develop technical skills, taking part in the mentoring scheme, and eventually becoming an ambassador for Comfrey and a member of the YPG committee. So I highly recommend taking part in other YPG activities.